Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to welcome to the stage our first keynote for today, Mr. Mark Middleton. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. I can't remember that much about myself. Thank you very, very much. Um, I'm really honored to be here. Uh, Roger tried to get me to come last year, but the schedule didn't work out. I wanted to come because I'm a big fan of, of Masterpiece Living. You know, nothing really happens in this day and age uh, unless we can cultivate the collision of diversity, the collision of disparate ideas. It's almost impossible for a company to grow from the inside out these days, uh, given this technological world that we live in. So you have to bring people together from different areas, different opinions, uh, who come to collaborate, who come to try to figure out what's next. And I think that's what they're doing better than, than anyone. There's a lot of us out there on all ends of this issue talking about what to say, what not to say, how to live, how not to live, what to eat, what not to eat. Masterpiece Living is kind of a clearinghouse for all of this information. You know, really smart people that are trying to say, let's try this, let's do this. This is what makes sense. Uh, it's important to try to figure out where things are going because I can tell you the speed of transformation is now exponential and it will continue to go faster and faster and faster. Technology is already changing your industry. It will totally transform your industry uh, in, in the very near future. Uh, you know, I know I'm not telling anybody here something they don't know when I say that even someone in the advanced stages of dementia has the ability to experience love and joy. They have the ability to live in the moment. Uh, and isn't that what we're all trying to do anyway? Isn't that what everybody tells us? The goal of life is to be in the moment. Uh, so I am grateful for this moment. Uh, all that to say thank you for allowing me to come and speak. Uh, we do say we're rebranding aging at Growing Boulder, uh, or as Ashton told me last night, it would be better said uh, we are rebranding growing older uh, because aging is something that we all do, and uh, when you apply it only to those of us as we get older, it becomes a pejorative. Um, uh, Ashton's going to give an incredible talk. Uh, uh, coming up later this morning on ageism. She's written a phenomenal book, as you know. She is a great spokesperson. It's important that we pay attention to the words that we use because we're all trying to change the narrative. Uh, but that said, I have a problem with some of the ageism in the anti ageist movement. Now let's accept the fact, and I'm not going to get too deep into this because she will, that we are all ageist. It's impossible for any of us to not be ageist. This is how we were growing up. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. But occasionally we at Growing Boulder are criticized for presenting what some call an idealized vision of aging. We are not presenting an idealized vision of aging. We are presenting a realized vision of aging. There are some who say that to pursue qualities of youth is a form of ageism. I say to not pursue qualities that are wrongly associated exclusively with youth is ageism. We need to reclaim them. Vitality, energy, creativity, strength, passion, purpose, significance, these have nothing to do with youth. They have everything to do with individuals. So I'm not afraid to go there. We don't tell stories on genetic super freaks and people that have more money than they know what to do with and that enables them to live a way that the rest of us can't. We tell stories about ordinary people that are living extraordinary lives. And the only reason these are extraordinary lives is because the rest of us just don't know what's possible. We're not providing a list of qualities that you have to have in order to age successfully. And many are now taking offense at the term aging successfully because again, we're all aging. Um, I get that being 85 can be a load of crap. Being 65 can be a load of crap. Being 40, being 30, being 20, being 18, there's no life stage that not, does not present significant challenges. But for some reason, we have chosen only to look at the negative side of being older. We have got to understand and realize that a moment at 90 is every bit as valuable as a moment at 19. Now certainly we may be doing something different with that moment, but we always have the ability to find significance and purpose and passion to create new relationships, to restore old relationships, to say things that we should have said, to think thoughts that we need to think, to come to terms with our spirituality. I mean, it never, ever ends. Uh, and I can tell you there are some people that want it to end. There are some who say 
that by showing what's possible, we are encouraging others to feel less than. You can be disabled, you can be obese, you can be coming off of a terrible roulette, you can have all sorts of problems. I'm not trying to tell you how you need to live. It's up to you to determine what is successful aging for you, but you need to know that the boundaries of what's possible have not only been poorly drawn, they have been inadequately and, and uh, misrepresented. You need to know what's possible. When we tell the story, and Ashton and I, is Ashton here? Uh, uh, when Ashton and I were at dinner with Larry and Roger and their beautiful wives last night, and we had a very short conversation about the impact of trying to keep pe older people safe. Surplus safety is what they call it. The notion that protecting downside risk to the extent that we eliminate the possibility of upside risk. It's all over your industry, probably because of insurance regulations. Uh, but at some point, you know, this is the age of liberation. If not now, when? You know, getting older is the time to take risk. And I told her a very quick story. Banana George Blair, the oldest barefoot water skier in history, called me up one day a few years ago. He was 93 at the time, and he said, Mark, I'm going to barefoot water ski this week. Will you bring a camera and take a picture of it and videotape it? He could barely talk. He'd been uh, in bed with pneumonia for six months. I said, George, if you're doing it, I'm there. I got there. His wife said we tried to talk him out of it. The guy who was dragging him in the boat said his doctors tried to talk me out of it, but this is what he lives to do, and this is what we're going to do. And I played this videotape, and it's on our website. You should look it out and uh, check it out, and you tell me what you think about it. But I played it at national caregiving conventions, uh, and George gets out there. He barefoot water skis, tumbles on over, 93 years old. Uh, and, and I say, if he had died that moment, would that have been a bad thing? And these are caregivers, and every one of them shake their head and said, no, it really would have been a good thing. I can tell you, and you know these people, there are many people out there beyond a certain age that do truly want to believe that they are beyond the age of possibility. You know, it's, life is tough. You work hard, you get tired, you take chances, you take risks. It's stressful. At some point, they want to say, I'm done. And now here I come and many others saying, no, you don't have to be done. There's more that can be done. It's never too late to make the rest of your life the best of your life. I absolutely believe that. I, it's not Pollyannism. It's optimism. Uh, it's understanding what the problems are and continuing to move forward. But there are a lot of people that don't want to hear that. They want to know that it's over and they can now sit on the couch and watch television. And if that's what they want to do, if that's what you want to do, there's nothing wrong with that. That's your choice. But again, we've got to know that uh, the menu of possibilities uh, doesn't have all the, the, the choices uh, th that are up there. Most in the anti-aging movement, I've read this in many, many books, We'll say that we can't do this alone, that we need policy change, we need institutional change, we need governmental change, we need to bring corporations along with us, we need to bring younger people along with us. And I say yes, 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 and yes. We need all of that. But I can tell you right now, if we wait for that, it's going to be too late for every person in this room, including the younger people. Change happens very slowly, particularly this kind of change. This doesn't mean we shouldn't work for it, we shouldn't pay attention to it, but if you want to change the ageist culture, change yourself. That's how cultural change occurs. It occurs one person at a time. And that's what we have learned at Growing Boulder. I'm off my, my soapbox now, I think. Uh, we have two television shows. One is a national show on PBS. Uh, we just went back on PBS in January. Uh, it's uh, available in like 75% of the country now. We hope it'll be in, in uh, others soon. We produce a show called Surviving and Thriving. We publish a magazine. We've got websites. We've got a radio show. Uh, we're doing a whole bunch of stuff, and we bring in national thought leaders from all over when we can to talk about issues. Uh, you know, we decided we were going to provide inspiration. We were going to show people what was possible, and now we're doubling back and realizing that when we inspire somebody, encourage somebody to do something, the next question is, okay, how do I do it? Uh, so now, you know, we are creating libraries. We've started something called the Art of Caregiving. Uh, we're doing uh, some big online summits that I'll talk about uh, coming up. But we put on guys like this to talk about stuff like this. Hello. 
I'm Dr. Roger Landry, and I'm a preventive medicine physician focusing on successful aging. I'm also the author of Live Long, Die Short, a guide to authentic health and successful aging. We've had many purposes in our lives as we've aged. We've had children, we've had jobs, we've had school, many things that uh, helped us get through the day and to meet our challenges and meet our goals. But as we age, that gets problematic. Older adults frequently have met all their assigned purposes and the ones they've, they took on in their lives. And so we wonder, what gets you out of bed in the morning? Well, whatever it is, we need it. As humans, we wither without purpose. It's been my observation that purpose, meaningful purpose, usually involves other living things. Humans, animals, plants, the environment. So think about it. What gets you up in the morning? What purpose do you have? You need it. It'll make your life a whole lot better. Dr. Landry likes to talk a lot about compressed morbidity. Um, uh, which is really what we're all about. You know, I, I get crazy with these people that are talking about trying to extend the human lifespan to 120, 130 years until we can improve the quality of our life for the time that we have now. That is a dystopian future ready to unfold. Um, but compressed morbidity is an interesting notion, and that is the fact that, yes, if we live the right kind of life, we may extend our life by a year or two, but if we can impress, uh, compress the period of disease, disability, and morbidity at the end of that life, if we can extend our life two years and compress the period of uh, disability uh, from 10 years to two weeks, you know, how great would that be? Uh, this is the poster girl, in my estimation, for compressed morbidity, although they're everywhere now. And again, please don't let the, don't get, the message get lost in the delivery system. Uh, Olga Kotelko uh, was in her late 70s when she started to uh, compete in track and field. They wrote a book about her. She was amazing. By the time she was in her mid-90s, she had set 38 world records of all sorts. The interesting thing that Olga did, uh, she was like many women of her generation, never participated in sports much at all, but in late 70s, for whatever reason, uh, she decided she wanted to start running. And then she said, you know what, I'm fascinated with the field events. So she hired a legitimate field coach who uh, instructed her in the shot put, the high jump, the pole vault, uh, the hammer throw, uh, all of these highly technical events, you know, where you've got to hit the, the takeoff board at the right place. You know, pole vaulting is doing a handstand on the end of a, of a stick. Um, so anyways, Olga, we had her on a radio show two weeks before she went to a track meet in Europe. She competed, flew to Europe. You don't need money. I'm not saying you got to have money. I'm not trying to make you feel less than if you don't fly to Europe. Flew to Europe, competed in the world championship, set several world records, said goodbye to her friends, went home, finished a book, uh, at 95 years old, went to bed and died. Zero morbidity. Lived her life till the end. This is happening with regularity. And it's not just exercise. Exercise is an important part of it. The interesting thing about Olga Kotelko is that somebody wrote a book on her. She became internationally famous. And a, a company that did research and brain scans asked if they could scan her brain while she was still alive. They did that. Uh, those scans set until she died. Uh, a new researcher got there and someone said, you know what, you're looking for a project. We've got these scans. Check them out. So they, they looked at her brain. Olga Kotelko's brain was, appeared to be normal for a 95-year-old woman. It had shrunk the right amount. It was not pristine. It had all the dings in it that an older brain would have. But what they noticed was in something called the corpus callosum. It's a large swath of nerves in between the, the, the two hemispheres of your brain, primarily responsible for transferring information from one side of the brain to the next. Olga Kotelko's corpus callosum was immense. All of this new white matter. It wasn't something that had been there forever. It wasn't genetic. It was something that she had developed. Primarily, they surmised because she started to do these highly technical events. Um, it's why they say golf is great for older people. Uh, you've probably read the, 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 the research lately where it says uh, dance is one of the greatest things you can do. Dance is better for you as you age than, than, than running a marathon, than anything, because it's 
it's, it's not linear, it's three-dimensional. It, 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 it works on your brain just as it does to learn a new language or to learn a new instrument if you've never done it. This is Joseph Coughlin, as many of you know. He's the leader of the MIT Age Lab, a very interesting fellow. We've had him in the magazine on the radio show. Every time he talks, he likes to say, you just gained 30, 40 years of longer life, and what are you doing with it? And it's absolutely true, and we all talk about it. Uh, Technology, medicine, healthcare, all of it have conspired to create an entirely new life stage that's never existed before in the history of humankind. If you make the right kind of lifestyle choices, you have every real possibility. Yeah, you need luck, bad things happen to good people, but you have the very real possibility of living three and four decades beyond what has been considered the normal retirement age. This is transformational. Some people say this is the biggest story of our lifetime, the creation of a new life stage. So what are you going to do with it? You know, people ask what our message is, you know, what's... We've got to work on our mission statement, but everything that we do comes down to this. You are not too old and it is not too late. And I show this sometimes when I talk because on our Facebook page we put videos, we put interviews, we do everything. And yes, we make memes and we put quotes some of which I write, thank you for that. You know, I spend time looking for quotes, I'll spend 30 minutes looking for a quote that I think is good, and I say, you know what? I could have made up 10 quotes before this. Uh, so occasionally I do. But this is what it comes down to. I put this on a post-it note because I, it's, it's not a quote from George Clooney, it's not a beautiful, you know, beautiful picture of, uh, you know, a 60-year-old woman in a bikini on the beach. Uh, it's a post-it note. So it all comes down to the message. And, I, and, and this is the actual metric report from Facebook. Now, everybody knows Facebook's changed their algorithm. It's harder uh, to get what we still get. Uh, this is 100% organic. We didn't pay a penny to boost this. Uh, within 48 hours, because that's how quickly it happens on Facebook, uh, this reached 13.5 million people. It doesn't mean anything, but the engagement numbers mean everything. It was liked or commented or shared over a million times. 824,000 people liked that on Facebook in 24 hours. You are not too old, it is not too late. That's the beauty of a good, of a good motto. Uh, that's why Nike says, just do it. You interpret what just do it means to you. That's why it works. That's why this works. People want to know this, most people. Again, I will agree to the caveat that there are some people that want to think that they are too old. So this is what we do. Uh, what, what I have learned in the time that I've been doing Growing Boulder is I can quote esteemed thought leaders, I can interview important people, um, we can share the results of incredible research and we do all of that, but the only thing that really, really moves the needle, the magic of personal transformation occurs when we can see ourselves and others. Uh, and I mean that literally. You know, at some point when people can, can, can learn to, 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 to think a little more broadly, uh, uh, you know, they'll say, oh, I get the message in that. I don't have to be a barefoot water skier. Uh, but this is where we are now. You know, if, if I want to inspire a 85-year-old, overweight, African-American woman uh, to think that it's not too late to make a difference in her community, I need to go out and find a story of an overweight, 85-year-old African-American woman who's just started a nonprofit in her community and is having a time of her life and is making a difference. That will work. Here's a perfect example of this. This is Ida Keeling. Ida started to run when she was in her late 60s when both of her sons were murdered uh, in a drug deal gone bad. She was so despondent, so depressed that her daughter thought she would take her own life. Her daughter made her get outside and walk with her. Uh, soon Ida was jogging and then running. Running not only saved her life, it soon defined her life. And two years ago in the Penn Relays, they had a special master's division of the 100 meter dash. And in front of the global television audience, uh, Ida set the world record for women 100 to 104. And as soon as it was over, she dropped down on the infield and popped off 10 push ups just to show she wasn't done. That video went viral. And watching it was a little old lady named Ella Mae Colbert in South Carolina. And six weeks later, LMA said, you know what, if Ida Keeling can do it, why can't I? So she got all of her friends together. They called the Guinness Book of World Records. She went to the track at the middle school behind her uh, 
in, in her neighborhood in South Carolina. She got up onto the starting line. They said, take your marks, go. She took one step and did a face plant. A 101-year-old woman split her chin wi wide open. Yes, certainly she's, you know, her life is over right now. She sat down, she said, bandage it up, uh, I'm not done yet. Uh, if you want to do something, you got to do it. So she got back up, they started her again. She beat Ida's time by 17 seconds. <laughs> that video went viral. And watching it in Louisiana was Julia Hurricane Hawkins, who had been a, a cyclist for years, but she quit riding her bike. She didn't start to run until she was 100 years old. She had run in one local track meet, and she saw Ida, and she saw Ella, and she said, you know what, I think I can do this. So she entered the U.S. Masters National Track and Field Championships in a 100-meter dash. We talked to her uh, the week after she destroyed both of their times. Uh, <laughs> and I said, Julia, you're 100 years old. You're going to go out on this track. You're going to run 100 meters. Aren't you afraid? And she said, honey... I was afraid that I would have a heart attack because I got cardiac issues. I was afraid I was going to fall and break a hip. I was afraid I was going to embarrass my family. I was so afraid of so many things that I actually took care of some paperwork at home in case I never came back. But, and we made a quote out of this, you have to look fear in the face. Uh, and that's what I did. I ran. And as we get older, we all have to learn to look fear in the face and we have to run. I don't mean run literally. Uh, we have to keep going. You know, we've probably interviewed more active centenarians than any media group in the world. Uh, the interesting thing about active centenarians um, is that they are as diverse as any group could be, more women than men. That'll probably change given the, the, the changes in our society and culture these days and the stress that everybody's under. Uh, but uh, black, white, rich, poor, urban, uh, What's the opposite of urban? Uh, rural, thank you. Uh, <laughs> everything. Here's the, here's, here's, there, there's, a, there's a lot of common denominators. The most common denominator of those who become active centenarians is that they have the ability to uh, deal with loss and move on. They mourn and they move on. You know, as we age, bad stuff is going to happen. It's inevitable. It's going to happen to all of us. And the sheer weight of one problem after another just knocks most people to the couch and they give up. Active centenarians don't give up. They find a way to deal with it and just keep moving on. Yeah, pile that on my back too. Uh, they have an ability to live in the moment, to find the value of each and every moment. Anyways, I wasn't done with that thing because seeing Julia Hurricane Hawkins was Mon Kaur, an Indian woman at 101 years old. She entered the World Masters Track and Field Championships and she broke all of their times. We had uh, Rob Reiner on our uh, radio show um, a while ago, put him in the magazine. He said, the last five years of my life are the most productive ever. Uh, he's 95 years old. Now, not everybody can be Rob Reiner. Not everybody can be Banana George, which is why we tell stories of people doing all sorts of things in all walks of life. It is never too late. And yes, depending upon your situation, you may not be able to write a book. Uh, this is May Laborde in the middle. May Laborde decided when she was 90 three years old that it was finally time to become an actress. It was her dream. So she got in her car at 93, she drove to Hollywood, she got an agent, and she worked incessantly until her death at 101. Um, it's never too late to do any of this stuff. Uh, I was uh, asked to come and speak to the senior leadership of one of the nation's largest hospital chains a year and a half ago. I knew the people there and they knew what I was going to say, but they asked me anyways, what will you say? And I told them what I was going to say and they said, well, no, we don't want to hear that. Um, <laughs> And I said, no, not a problem. Uh, I don't really need to say it. Um, and then they called me back and said, come on and say it. Uh, and what they wanted to know, this was, uh, this was a conference of the senior leadership that was called the SAGE Conference, Strategies Aligning for Geriatric Excellence. And uh, they wanted to know what I thought about how they can uh, impact the, uh, the care of the frail elderly. Because you guys know it better than anybody. This is an onslaught, a wave that is not going to end. I know nothing about caring for the frail elderly, delivering health care to them. I'm going to tell you that right now. Uh, and I told them that. And I said, but, here, but here's what I'll tell you. If you want to deliver health care to people in their 80s and 90s, 
you back out of it, and you modify the lifestyle of people in their 30s and 40s and 50s. And if you don't do that, this problem that you're facing now will never, ever end. It's going to get worse and worse and worse because the 10,000 of us a day that are turning 65 every day will be turning 75 and then 85, and it is going to be a nightmare. Um, and, 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 and fortunately, not because of what I said, uh, every major healthcare uh, company in the world is pivoting as fast as they can from sick care to well care. Uh, they are figuring out ways to get into prevention, uh, to make their money doing that. There won't be such a thing as hospitals in, 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 in 50 years. It'll all be telemedicine. There'll be an emergency room where you go to, but nobody wants to go to the hospital. Uh, so how do we improve the lives? You modify the lifestyle of people in the 40s and their 50s. Uh, I, I was hired to do interviews at a uh, the Lake Nona Impact Forum. Nobody knows about it. They have it every year. And this is the ultimate collusion of ideas. They bring people together with the uh, idea that they are going to disrupt aging. We're talking about the CEOs of Johnson & Johnson and Nestle and Cleveland Clinic and on and on and on. And over the last two years, three years, I've interviewed uh, uh, Eric Topol and Dean Ornish and Deepak Chopra and Mehmet Oz and Sanjay Gupta. Uh, and this was just uh, maybe six weeks ago. This year, also, uh, Elizabeth Blackburn, who we had had on a radio show uh, a year ago, and I was thrilled to see Elizabeth. Elizabeth is the 2009 Nobel Prize winner for discovering uh, telomerase, which is an enzyme that, that, that impacts uh, your telomeres. Telomeres are the caps on the ends of our chromosomes, and they are a biological clock as much as anything can be. Uh, and when, as you age, uh, these telomeres get shorter and shorter and shorter until they reach the point where uh, the, the cells can no longer replicate. Uh, it doesn't protect. It's like the caps on your shoelaces. Uh, when they wear down, uh, your shoelaces will fray. And the same thing happens to your chromosomes. And when there's not enough information there, uh, your cells can no longer replicate and you die. Uh, so she found out that telomerase can slow down uh, the degradation of telomeres. And guess what? Uh, affects telomerase, lifestyle. So she proved at a cellular level what we've all been talking about for many, many years can no longer be denied that lifestyle modification uh, is the key to quality of life and in many cases to the length of your life. Uh, we talk a lot about epigenetics. Uh, it's the notion that, that, that something other uh, than your then the genes that you have control the way you live. Uh, you may have genetic predispositions for many different things, and whether or not those genes express themselves is to a large degree determined by the way that you live. You can be genetically predisposed for lung cancer or breast cancer or on and on and on. And those genes may never, ever express themselves depending upon how you live. Um, you have control over your genes to a large degree. Amazingly, the most important determinant of how we age is not genetics. It is our lifestyle. And the most important lifestyle determinant of how we age, contrary to popular belief, is neither exercise nor diet. The most important lifestyle determinant of how we age is our belief system about aging. This is not me telling you this. This is one research project after another. What the mind believes, the body embraces. Unfortunately, we have all been brainwashed. We are victims of the largest mass brainwashing campaign in history. And it started very, very young. It, in fact, starts uh, the moment you were born. Uh, there were multiple studies done in the 60s and 70s when many of us grew up. Uh, over 700 children's books, and older people either didn't exist in these books, or if they did exist, they were totally inconsequential to plot. These are not the actual names of these books. <laughs> I see people mumbling, I made these names up. Uh, but they do represent what's in the books. Older people, totally unimportant. By the time children are three, to, at this, not, not back in the 60s and 70s, but today, by the time children are three, most have a very negative impression of aging. And it's not just children's books, it's television. Television is the worst of all. It's doctors prescribing medication ahead of lifestyle modification. It's mandatory retirement ages. It's over the hill jokes that aren't funny. It's all of this. 
television primarily again. We have been the victims of this mass propaganda campaign, primarily orchestrated by large advertising and media companies and their 30-second hypnosis sessions, a.k.a. commercials. You are old, and you are weak, and you are tired, and you are ugly, and you are useless. And only our product or our service can make you whole again. You may even be in a rock band. Self-acceptance is their enemy. It's the ruination of their business, and they will do anything to cultivate dissatisfaction and self-hate to this moment. Uh, and I'm sure uh, Ashton's going to talk about a lot of this stuff. I spoke to uh, one of the uh, most respected liberal arts colleges not long ago. A colleges, these are 20-year-olds. You know, and the professor before I talked said, all right, I'm going to say a word, and as soon as I say a word, I want everybody in the class to write down what comes to mind. And I thought she was going to say different words. She got up there and said, old, 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 old. I thought she had some sort of tick. Uh, but, they, but they got it. Uh, they all, within 10 seconds, they all had five words that immediately came to mind uh, when she said old. And I wrote them down when they started reading them aloud. These are 20-year-olds at, at a very progressive university. What kind of problems do they have moving forward? Now, despite the fact that we're talking about living longer, living better, uh, the, the suicide rate in the last few years, for the first time since the 1950s, the suicide rate for older people has gone up. Uh, the, highest rate, uh, the highest rate of suicide of all is white men over the age of 75. Uh, I've never heard anybody say why, but I'm going to take a shot at it. Um, I think it's because white men over the age of 75 have never been women and they've never been black. And they've never been Hispanic. They've never had to deal with being an outsider. They've never had to deal with uh, the, the problems that, that, that most other people have had to. All of a sudden, uh, now the culture doesn't think they're that cool and that hip. Now, obviously, it's, it's opioids. Uh, it's lack of exercise. It's a lot of different things. Uh, and it's primarily low socialization. As you all know, it's been proven time and time again that as we age, low socialization is more harmful to our health than alcoholism, than smoking, Another one. Somebody help me with it. Uh, or obesity. It's actually on the slide. <laughs> so, so this is this is the challenge. This is this is the business that we're all in. You know, trying to find a way to connect one on one individually. Uh, with people. And I'm going to take you through this very quickly. This is Ruth Hamilton. We did a story on Ruth Hamilton when we worked at the television station when she turned 105. We were at the office one day. We hadn't seen Ruth for four years. I said, you know what? I wonder what happened to Ruth. Let's see if we can find her because she was a hoot. So we made some phone calls and we found her living on the top floor of a care center in downtown Orlando. Uh, we asked if we could walk in. Uh, they said, sure. She was, uh, this, is, this is Ruth. This was Ruth the first time we saw her. Barely, didn't know who we were. We had to wake her up. She kind of came to, uh, you know, kind of came awake. We said, Ruth, do you remember? It's Mark and Bill. We did stories on you at Channel 2. Okay. Um, she kind of woke up and we said, you know what, Ruth, we're going to come back. And she smiled. Um, she hadn't had a visitor in three years. So we came back. And then we came back again. And then we came back again. And then we came back again. Uh, and I took my laptop and I told her one day, Ruth, this is a camera and I'm going to turn it on. And Ruth was a teacher years ago. Uh, and you can say whatever you want. And then I'm going to put it on the internet. And she knew what the internet was. And people all over the world are going to hear what you have to say. And all of a sudden, Ruth was a new person. Uh, so here she is talking about anything and everything. We dubbed her Ruth 1898 because, you know, you always got to try to market it to the extent that you can. Uh, we named her the world's oldest blogger, which she was and is to this day, and she recorded 15 or 20 blogs. Uh, we would post them. We would take questions back to her after we did, and this is the kind of thing she said. We've got everything in our minds. And she's uh. got it and everybody's got it. All different, but we're there, and if we keep using that mind, you got to oil it, and the way you oil it is to use it. And I go over poems, I can recite poems that I learned in, in kindergarten, I guess. <laughs> can you recite a poem now? A poem? Yes. Well, let's see, what could I say? 
Oh, I, I can say it in Latin. Mica, mica, padre stella. Mirror quinum si sam bella. Splendens imilo. Adla wailet gamer kylo. That's twinkle, twinkle, little star. <laughs> I said it in Latin. Mica, mica, see, twinkle, twinkle. Mica, mica, padre stella. Small star. How I wonder what you are, up and in the sky so blue. What are you doing up there? I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, I use my mind. If you don't use it, it'll go to waste. And that's why people get senile, they call it. Because the mind has never been used. It just sits there. But you've got to work it. You gotta keep it moving, and I sure keep mine going. I love to eat and talk. <laughs> that was one of the last ones that we did, and I can tell you honestly, when, when we first started hanging out with her uh, this last time, she was lost. Uh, it came back. Uh, I don't think anybody at the care home knew that she was a teacher. I don't think they understood that her mind could be reawakened. Um, it just took someone caring enough to try to find what it was that would push her button. And, and this is the absolute truth. One of the first times we saw Ruth and one of the last times we saw her. She painted her nails. She put on her makeup. She put on her jewelry. She was excited because someone was going to come visit her. Um, so how do, you, how do you connect with you know, the, the audience. You know, everybody talks about baby boomers. There's three things that baby boomers, you know, you, you, you inspire baby boomers and you address their fears. And there's three things that baby boomers fear more than death themselves. Um, one of those is chronic disease and disability. Uh, you know, chronic disease, uh, depending upon what you read, uh, accounts for 70 to 80 percent of our gross uh, domestic product, you know, $1.2 trillion uh, goes to preventable chronic diseases. Uh, nobody wants to uh, have chronic disease. Dementia, uh, certainly well-founded. They say that 50% uh, of all of us over the age of 85 have Alzheimer's, and by 2050, there'll be 16 million of us, uh, and it will cost somewhere in the neighborhood of $3 trillion to care for us, which is the, you know, the greatest health crisis that's ever faced this country. So don't think of this as exercise. And, and, and don't look at this and, and think only this kind of activity. Whatever it is that you need to do to keep moving, you know, lo and behold, the two number one things that, that, that can prevent dementia, uh, can delay dementia, or can even overcome the pathology uh, is socialization is activity. There have been many people that have died and for whatever reason they opened up their brains and they said, oh my God, look at the plaque in this brain. This person showed no signs of dementia. They overcame the pathology by the way that they lived. Uh, so don't think of this as exercise. You know what you should think of this as? You should think of this as prehabilitation. I got a surgeon friend who's an unbelievable guy, maybe the best minimally invasive surgeon, spinal surgeon in the world. He hates to do surgery. He's the best that there is. If time allows, he will put all of his patients through a rigorous prehabilitation uh, session uh, for as long as he can, and in many cases, surgery is no longer required. Well, I thought about that, and I said, you know what? It is a given. It's a no-brainer. Each and every one of us, everybody in this room is going to face a series of health challenges as we age. We are human beings. We are mortal beings. We are not getting out of here alive. Um, and we are going to have health challenges. So why are we not prehabilitating for them? Because, to a very large degree, the interventions that are available and the speed of recovery after that intervention is largely determined by your overall health and well-being when you encounter that health obstacle. Absolutely true. If you want extreme recovery, if you want to bounce back, if you want to prepare to come back, then that's what you need to do. The number one fear more than death for baby boomers is running out of money. Actuaries uh, and financial planners actually now call it longevity risk. That's the longevity paradox. The one thing that we aspire to more than anything else, longevity, is the one thing that threatens the thing that we aspire to, longevity. Nobody 
saves enough money or plans to be 90 or 95 years old. And more and more and more of us are. If you're a 65 year old woman today, you've got a one in four chance of living to be 100. So don't think about this as exercise. Think about this as putting money in the bank because this in fact is the number one investment that each and every one of us can make today. If you're a millennial and you're struggling because I don't have any money to save, this is the best investment you can make. The greatest return that you can make is this. This will reduce your future health care costs, which is the thing that more than anything else could wipe you out in the future. We've started something called the Health Wealth Connection. We're doing an online summit. I won't bore you with the details. I won't show you this video because I want to show you this one. Uh, multiple bouts with cancer, broken necks, uh, cardiac issues, pacemakers, uh, uh, artificial this, uh, replaced hips. These are not genetic freaks. These are ordinary people. Just like a couple of high school superstars, John Course and Ed Graves are studying the heat sheet at the Rowdy Gaines Masters Classic, underlining their events, checking out their lane assignments. Ed and John are the two oldest swimmers in a meet filled with former high school, college, and even Olympic athletes. And together with Betty Lorenzi and Joan Campbell, they're about to make swimming history. This fabulous foursome is attempting to break a world record in the 200 meter freestyle relay. Their ages? 86, 89, 92, and 93. Combined, that puts them in the 360 plus age group. The record thereafter was set a decade ago by a team from Japan. Meet host and three-time Olympic gold medalist Rowdy Gaines stops the meet momentarily to let the crowd and the other swimmers know what's about to happen in lane number one. Hey Ed, are we giving you the jitters? Well, a little bit, yeah. 92-year-old Ed Graves is the leadoff swimmer. Each team member will swim 50 meters, two laps freestyle. Next up is the youngster in the group, 86-year-old Joan Campbell, who never swam a lap until she was 59. I started swimming after my children quit. And these may be the two biggest laps of her life because the team is now ahead of world record pace. The third leg is swum by 89-year-old Betty Lorenzi. Betty couldn't compete last year and had a pretty good excuse. Unfortunately, she had to miss the meet last year due to the fact that she was recovering from a fall where she broke her neck. But she's back. Battling back from a broken neck at age 89 and going for a world record. <laughs> the anchor man is 93-year-old attorney John Course, who is about to deliver the closing argument. As the seconds tick by, it's now apparent that the record will fall and that all here are witnessing a life-affirming demonstration of what's possible with passion and perseverance. What happens when ordinary people refuse to let life put them on the sidelines. They don't just break the world record, they obliterate it by 15 seconds, stunning a guy who knows something about breaking world records. It's incredible, Mark. I, you know, I, it just never ceases to amaze me that they can, uh, they can do things like this, you know? You and I were just talking about, we're gonna be there 30 years and I just can't even imagine, so it's proud. Uh, you know, I had grandparents that never had this, they never exercised and, uh, just to be able to have this, it just means a lot to me that they could be here at my meet, you know? It really was pretty cool. It's a world record, but more importantly, it's a master class in active longevity. Just keep trying, despite everything that comes up, and everything does come up. But uh, if you just stay at it, that's what counts. I heard a rumor that you had a broken neck a year ago. That can't be true. Oh, yes, it is. How do you come back from a broken neck in your age to set a world record? What's the secret? Swimming. <laughs> really? I'm serious. Swimming helped. Accepting the never-ending challenge of aging and celebrating the never-ending opportunities. They just did one, and now they're anxious to do the other. Well, I'd love to celebrate 
with champagne, but I'm on heart medicine right now. They won't let me drink anything alcoholic, so I guess I'll celebrate with the Virgin Mary. So John says he can't he can't drink tonight. What about you? I'm, I'm gonna make it up for him. <laughs> and a few hours later, they toast one another, their new world record, and the good time still ahead. I'm still learning about life. That's what's helped me along. Do you still enjoy life? Yes! Especially when I break world records. It's a relay team of hope, inspiration, and possibility, teaching by example the secrets to active longevity. <laughs> to be passionate about a sport that you enjoy, uh, to really care about your health and take good care of yourself, and to pursue it with great gusto and enjoy life. And I need to make some changes in my life after this meet. <laughs> oh, 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 can I go back? Uh, this is John Course. He emailed me this last week. He just turned 94. He went water skiing uh, uh, with his daughter. And I think he is having a drink that day, so he is able to get it. Uh, Okay, but I want to show you this, and again, I, I use these as examples, but I almost feel like I have to offer a disclaimer now. You don't need to, to take up running. You know, please don't if you're not interested in it. Take up something. Uh, the guy on, on the left is Orville Rogers, who we've interviewed a couple of times. Orville had bypass surgery. Six different arteries were clogged. He had bypass surgery. He continued to run because he was running before that. And then at age 93, he had a very serious stroke. His entire left side was paralyzed. At 93, he had a, a serious stroke. He told his doctor, give me the most intense rehabilitation program that you can because not only am I coming back, I'm going to kick butt. Uh, this was the U.S. Na Masters Indoor Track and Field Championships. Orville on the left at 99, running against Dixon Hempel, 92. Now, Dixon was a triathlete all his life. He was hit on his bicycle when he was in his 70s, was in the hospital for 40-some days, had multiple, multiple surgeries. But, you know, like Orville, they came back. And this is them competing in the 60-meter dash. <laughs> These are not genetic super freaks. These are just people that refuse to let life beat them down. Dixon said, if I could have leaned a little more at the tape, I would have beat him. Orville wins by five one hundredths of a second. Uh, I'm running out of time. Later, I'm going to talk about this. The most important, valuable consumer in America today is a 45 to 65-year-old woman because she is making health care decisions uh, for three and even four generations. She makes most of the purchasing decisions for her family. Uh, she's living longer. She's spending more. She will be the recipient of the greatest transfer of wealth in the history of humankind. If you want to figure out how to grow your business, you figure out how to connect with this woman. Uh, you are in the passion, purpose, and possibility business. Uh, we are all in that business these days. You need to provide social connections, create growth opportunities for everybody, uh, and deliver experiences. It's moments of joy and experiences that are the different difference. I don't really care. I mean, it's important, and I know that, and I don't want to sound stupid by saying what you build, the brick and mortar is not important. It's critically important. But the new people that are coming in, they want to know what are you going to do to connect with me personally, no matter where I am. How are you going to meet me? How are you going to provide experiences that make a difference? It doesn't have to be experience running in a track and field meet, but how are you going to find experiences that make a difference? You are a launch pad to what's next. That's what it is. It's no longer a place to come and die. It's no longer a place to come and unwind. You are a launch pad to what's next. And what's next is different for every stage of our life. Uh, for assisted living, there's got to be something what's next. That's what you need to figure out. I'll skip that, I'll skip that, and I will go to this. Technology is transforming everything about the business that you do. We are now doing a story on a woman who we're going to call the most technologically, technologically connected 70-year-old in America. She's already tech, technologically literate, but we're going to take her to the next level. We're going to show what it's going to be like for all of us in the very few years ahead. I get up, I don't want to cook, I want someone to bring food to my house. Delivery.com, Peapod, Blue Apron. I got to go somewhere, I'm going to call Uber or Lyft. Who needs a car anymore? I need to go to the doctor, I'm going to do it through telehealth. I'm going to connect with my doctor. I want to communicate with my grandkids. I want to travel, but I don't have the money or the time, so I'm going to put on one of these fancy 3D virtual 
VR travel deals that are out there everywhere now, sitting at home, embracing technology, understanding how to use it, uh, is going to transform each and every one of our lives, and you guys need to figure out how to bring this in to the communities that you have and the people that you serve, and I'm out of time, so I will thank you very much.